Hello everybody, this is Philip Jonas at Kalamazoo Valley Community College presenting OpenStax Principles of Economics. In this module, covering sections 24.3 and 24.4, we'll be covering shifts in aggregate supply and aggregate demand. In this module, you will learn to explain how productivity growth changes the aggregate supply curve, how changes in input prices change the aggregate supply curve, how confidence affects aggregate demand, and explain how government policy can affect aggregate demand. In a previous module, we first encountered our model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. It's time to start talking about how these curves can shift. So let's start by talking a little bit about the supply side. So on the supply side, of course, we effectively have two aggregate supply curves. Our long-run aggregate supply curve representing potential GDP and our short-run aggregate supply curve that holds some prices or wages rigid. Now the current condition of our economy as defined by the equilibrium of aggregate demand and supply, the short run version specifically. So right here we're looking at an economy that isn't at potential GDP. We've got a bit of an output gap here and then let us see more clearly how shifts in aggregate supply and aggregate demand affect our outcomes. So the first thing we are going to look at is a potential shift in productivity. Productivity affects the ability of our economy to produce goods and services. So this is going to be a supply side shift. Now what's a little bit special about a productivity shift is that we have to shift both aggregate supply curves. So the position of potential GDP, our long run aggregate supply curve, is affected by productivity. In fact, I would go so far as to say that um, growth and productivity is the primary factor for an advanced economy that's going to increase long-run aggregate supply. But any time we shift that long-run aggregate supply curve, we are going to be shifting our short-run aggregate supply curve as well. So what does a practical example of this looks like? Well, let me go ahead and share with you just a really cool set of numbers about productivity across many, many countries in this world, almost 200 of them, prepared by a project called the Penn World Tables out of the universities of Groningen and California at Davis. Um, so here are just two of uh, these, these productivity series. We've got the United States in blue and China in red. Now it's very neat to have this sort of data covering many different countries at once so that you can do certain types of comparative analysis. But I want to be really clear before there's a misunderstanding here that this represents productivity relative to within the country itself. So it's an index number. The way I'm showing it to you here, as always uh, formatted through the Federal Reserve Economic Data Service, FRED, is that for both countries, we're starting at the number 100 in the year 2000. So that doesn't mean that productivity is equal between these countries. We're just setting that as the reference point within each country. And then we're seeing how productivity evolves relative to that reference point. So we can, for example, see here in the beginning of the 21st century, Chinese productivity, as estimated by this project, is rising faster than American productivity. But where the American productivity continues rising at you know, a slow and steady pace, advanced economy, in more recent years, the estimates for Chinese productivity actually start to drop a little bit. Now, technical note here for those of you who are interested, this productivity measure is something called total factor productivity. It's way beyond the scope of what we're talking about here, but basically it refers to productivity of 
all inputs that the macro economy uses. So this isn't just labor productivity, it also refers to capital productivity and so on and so forth. So let's say we are looking at the experience of the United States here, rising productivity, and we wanna go ahead and put that into our model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. So back to the model. Here's our basic setup. Changes in productivity are supply side factors. Since we're looking at increases in productivity, we want to go ahead and shift both aggregate supply curves to the right. And again, to make things a little bit more clear, notice that we've already got an output gap in this economy. So we're not necessarily at potential GDP. So let's go ahead and do a shift once. Here are both curves moving to the right. And let's look at our effects. So number one, equilibrium condition of our economy, intersection of aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply. We see this point moving down and right. So that of course means in terms of output, when productivity rises, our economy produces more real GDP. No big surprise there. And then number two, we're going to see some downward pressure on the price level. Um, you can see that in real life a little bit more since productivity isn't necessarily one number that equally affects all products at once, right? Certain areas increase quite a bit. In terms of productivity, look for example at um, you know computer chips and other things. Productivity doesn't move a great deal. <laughs> um, look for example at a human service like childcare. Right, there's only so many children a person can supervise at a time with relatively mild gains. So what we should perhaps expect then even though we have an aggregate model here, is that when we see the downward pressure on prices, you know, the, the computer chips, they're gonna come down in price, the childcare maybe not so much. Now, second aspect that needs to be highlighted. When we look at an output gap, or in other words, we're also going to be seeing some unemployment here because our economy is not at potential GDP, you might misleadingly think that Productivity growth, since it moves our short-run aggregate supply curve to the right, increases real GDP, that it might make that output gap smaller. But of course it doesn't, because productivity growth moves both aggregate supply curves to the right. So the gap between our long-run aggregate supply curve and the equilibrium is still there. The, the entire relationship shifted to the right. Um, still good news for our economy, right? Like we got richer, we got more productive, but productivity growth is probably not gonna get you out of an output gap. Let's go ahead and do this one more time just to illustrate it. So notice both curves shifting to the right, and as a consequence, gap is still there. All right, let's talk about a second type of impact we can have when it comes to aggregate supply that will make a difference to the size of the output gap. So let's think about this a little bit. If we want to have an equilibrium that is at a different distance relative to potential GDP, we need something that will shift the short run aggregate supply curve so new equilibrium, new real GDP, but not the long run aggregate supply curve so that we get a different size gap. So what could that be? Well, a difference between the long run aggregate supply curve and the short run aggregate supply curve is of course that the short run aggregate supply curve includes some rigid or even fixed prices or wages, especially input prices. So one possible story we could be looking at here is one that's a really popular story in macroeconomics to look at, and that is the price of oil. So while we still live in a massively carbon-based economy, if you will, oil just goes into so many production processes and even the ones it doesn't go into because of its effect on transport cost and such, um, just affects so much ability in our economy to produce. So economies are quite sensitive to the price of oil, which because the 
um, supply of oil isn't all that elastic. It's, you know, not super easy to, to change um, how many oil wells you have in existence, or not super fast anyway. Uh, these, these swings in the oil price can be pretty big. Uh, second reason, I want to use this as an example. Once again, let's look at the real world numbers first is because of uh, a cool graph I want to share with you. So here is the price of oil in the 21st century. Now, when I say the price of oil, of course, there isn't just one oil. Oil actually differs a little bit in its composition depending on where it's from. But one, you know, really common benchmark price is the so-called West Texas Intermediate. And this right here is being traded at a very big transfer point here in Oklahoma. We've actually got daily data here from the Energy Information Administration, once again, displayed through Fred. So what you can see here is, first of all, look at how the price of oil can change, right? So for example, right here in the run-up and at the beginning of our Great Recession, 2008, price of oil over 140 a barrel, beginning of the 21st century, not even 30 a barrel. I mean, that's less than a decade. And we're looking at a change of almost a factor of five. Um, so we'll look in a second, of course, that's not going to be great news in terms of how much the economy can produce. Uh, but then secondly, you can also see very dramatically if an economy experiences a recession because oil is used in so many processes and the supply is not that elastic, the price of oil just, wow, can just really come down in a relatively short time period, okay? And then let's look at this one more time, of course, with an event that'll ruin my charts for the rest of my career. And that is our COVID lockdown here in 2020 because that was an even more severe sort of decrease in economic activity that also didn't last very long, leaving us to just observe an incredible phenomenon that is super duper rare in economics. And I just have to share that with you. So look right here, early 2020, during the lockdown, price of oil goes down, 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 down. Here is zero. And then one very special day, <laughs> price <laughs> actually goes negative by a lot over negative $30 a barrel. So what we're looking at here is that when the price of oil first came down, of course, um, lots of oil production is diverted into storage because like, it's just not worth it to sell it right now. But the storage filled up and it's not like you can just pour the stuff down the drain. So for this one very special day, oil sellers had to pay oil buyers just to like get it off their hands. Very short lasting, of course, everybody adjusted very quickly, crazy situation. Nevertheless, a fun day to keep in mind now that it's passed. That was the year 2020 on April 20th. So 2020, 420, negative price of oil at least this oil in this place. All right, enough fun, let's go back to our model. So when input prices change, we're gonna go ahead and represent this as a shift of the short run aggregate supply curve, but assuming for a while that this isn't like, oh, oil doesn't exist anymore, um, let's say our potential GDP is unchanged. So I want to show you how a negative oil price shock, an adverse one, one that's bad for our economy, is just a really uniquely bad set of news for our economy. Let's go ahead and take that short run aggregate supply curve, shift it to the left to represent the higher input prices. And now look what happens here. So number one, real GDP side, of course, output moves further away from potential, bigger output gap, contraction of the economy, rising unemployment. But then in addition to that, 
We are also seeing the price level rising. We're seeing increased inflation. So like all bad things are happening at once. Output down, employment down, inflation up. Real bad situation, sometimes referred to by the portmanteau, stagflation. A combination of the words stagnating economy and inflation. Stagflation. Right, so these are the sorts of shifts we can see when it comes to aggregate supply. And then, of course, positive developments in input prices, falling input prices, you're going to shift that short-run aggregate supply curve to the right. And likewise, if you have some sort of crazy story where productivity decreases, both curves to the left. But of course, you can also have shifts in the aggregate demand curve. And what all can shift the aggregate demand curve? Well, the aggregate demand curve represents all plants bending in our economy, so like, a lot of different stuff. Um, but something I really want to highlight here for our first example is that, for example, our expectations about the future and our confidence in our economic situation actually produces pretty sizable changes in spending behavior. And once again, let me show just a super cool uh, data series to you here, produced by the University of Michigan. So we're going to have our economy once again already at an output gap, just so we can see a little bit more in detail what's going on. And here we are looking at our consumer sentiment series from the University of Michigan. This is survey-based data of consumers. Two things are being tracked. Number one, current economic conditions or perceptions thereof, I should say, plus expectations about future economic conditions, which are then combined into one index number. It's just an index number. The specific number doesn't mean anything. It's normed to be equal to 100 in the year 1966. And um, sort of the level of where this hovers, surveys are weird, can change over time. So like, don't maybe start comparing this to 1966 in any sensible way. But what we are really looking for is, is the line going up or is the line going down? <laughs> line going up, people feel better. Line going down, people feel worse. And here we see something really cool when we compare to the recognized 21st century recessions right here. Notice, so here's our first recession. Notice consumer confidence dives before the recession starts. Again, 2008. Consumer confidence dives, and very much continues to dive during, during the housing crash, starts diving even before the crash. Um, little, little exception to the trend here, COVID lockdown, of course. Uh, that, that's not a situation of consumers losing confidence in our economy. There was something completely else going on. So there the dive coincides with the beginning of that recession. So that's what we call the leading indicator, a number that starts moving before the recession hits. Neat. A um, little bit before you get too excited about this thing. But <laughs> it's entirely possible for consumer confidence data to take dives. No recession comes and it bounces right back. So this sometimes leads to jokes about the economics profession along the lines of economists have predicted six out of the last three recessions, right? Like you can have this dive and it's not guaranteed that a recession will happen. Nevertheless, leading indicator, very cool. And somewhat unusually, so like for, for the real adverse impact here, we want to see the dive and then it like stays low. If we look at the early 2020s here, consumer confidence way down, even more down after the end of the pandemic here, still down, but economic performance in the usual ways we measure, real GDP, unemployment rate, um, pretty good, maybe even very good. So bit of a puzzle going on there right now. What are we looking at? Are our numbers wrong? Are the people wrong? Lots of interesting discussions to be had, but not for us. For us, 
back to our basic model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. So let's look at consumer confidence in both possible directions. Here we've got an economy that's already got an output gap. And then good news, consumers just like really start feeling like this is gonna, gonna end here real soon, right around the corner, start buying some cars and so on and so forth. Aggregate demand shifts to the right. And what do we see? A little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy here. As confidence in the economy grows, our output gap shrinks, higher real GDP, and inflation starts picking back up. Vice versa, here's our economy with an output gap. Consumers start feeling even worse about the economy, cut back even harder on spending. Once again, self-fulfilling prophecy. Consequently, output gap gets even bigger. Real GDP falls further, further downward pressure on the price level. So it's, it's one of those interesting systematic effects in macroeconomics that our very perception of reality can shape reality itself. Right, finally, in a future model, we want to have a look at, apart from what the economy just sort of does by itself, how of course we can use economic policy to try to dampen these business cycles, make the output gaps smaller. So as our final example, let's look at an economy that's already experiencing an output gap. And now we're gonna go ahead and boost aggregate demand, not because of something consumers are doing, but because the government steps in with one type of policy. So for our final data series here today, I want to share with you a famous bit of economic policy that happened in response to the Great Recession, 2008-2009. There was a big um, law of fiscal policy of government spending designed to boost aggregate demand. How does that work? Well, if you look at aggregate demand, consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports, government spending is literally one of the components of aggregate demand. You want to boost aggregate demand. One of the ways you can do it is increase government spending. So this big, big bill was called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARA for short, often referred to in the media as the stimulus. Now this bill here, of course, designed to fight a recession that happened quite a while ago. So you'll notice this data series here labeled discontinued because it's over. But let's look at the passage of this bill and its impact on federal spending expenditures only in the first quarter of 2009 going forward. Uh, please notice this note this bill also had tax cuts in it. Tax cuts aren't graphed here. This is just the expenditure side. Also, as is usually the case, um, these numbers are being expressed at annual rates. <laughs> so for example, here in first quarter 2010, $240 billion. That doesn't mean we spend $240 billion extra at the government level in 2010 first quarter only. That means if that spending here had continued for the whole year, it would have been $240 billion. So if we add all these numbers up and divide by four to get to an actual total, just in case you're curious, it was still a massive amount, I think something like $673 billion in additional government spending total. So big increase in spending, big focus, of course, on making the spending happen really, really fast because you're trying to do something about the recession right now. And then it peters out and is pretty much undetectable by the time we hit 2013. Um, something you want to remember here for a future module, Notice, even with a law that's totally focused on we have to increase government spending right now to fight the recession. Notice the recession here over. Government spending still climbing. Not necessarily bad counter-cyclical news. The recovery from the Great Recession took terribly long. Maybe even something on the order of 10 years. So all this extra spending here actually didn't end up causing a bunch of inflation. We'll talk about that down the line. Um, but for a smaller recession that doesn't have a recovery that lasts as long, that's a real, real thing we have to worry about. So-called lags when it comes to policy implementation. We'll talk about it. All right. But anyway, for now, aggregate supply and aggregate demand.
back to our model, we've got the government spending a bunch of additional money on top of its usual spending. So the G component of aggregate demand increases. So we go ahead and take that aggregate demand curve, shift it to the right. And what do we see? Two effects. Number one, down on the x-axis, real GDP gets closer to potential GDP. Perhaps the recession is even over. And of course, it also then increases some pressure on prices. So you don't want to overshoot here or you may end up with a bunch of undesirable inflation. And that's just one first example of how economic policy can work in the context of, in this module, we're learning about what shifts aggregate supply and aggregate demand curves. So let's review. In this module, you learned how productivity growth changes the aggregate supply curve how input prices change the aggregate supply curve, how confidence affects aggregate demand, and how government policy can affect aggregate demand. I will see you next time.